Go back. There we go. No, I've got control. Okay. This photograph didn't save the world, but it saved this dog's world. Back when I was in college, we had an assignment at the local newspaper. It was to pho photograph an animal that was about to be euthanized, try to find a home for it. Everybody at the newspaper hated that assignment, but I loved it because it had a, I had a chance to save an animal by taking a picture. My animals always got saved, and that's when I realized that pictures have power. When I was a kid, he either dreamed of being an astronaut or a photographer for National Geographic. Back then, he had a better chance of being an astronaut because Geographic hadn't hired a new photographer in over a decade. And I had to travel out of a three-state area for most of my life, so I wasn't a really good candidate for a travel photographer. But I wanted to use photographs to change the way people thought, way to change the way that society was. Back then, Geographic was doing stories on gold, silver, platinum. What kind of stories did I want to do? You might say that my career got started in the dumps. Back in 1981, there was only one mandatory recycling program in all of America. Other parts of the world, it was so valuable, it was like gold. In this dump in Manila, you could be shot if you stole garbage out of the dump. So in 1981, I proposed a story for National Geographic on trash and I got my dream job. Back then, the exciting thing about working for Geographic wasn't just the photography. They had one of the biggest circulation magazines in the entire world. They had 11 million people got the magazine just in the U.S. And for every person that got the magazine, another four people saw it. So 44 million people saw that magazine every month, 20% of America. Shortly after this, this story was published, recycling began to take off. 1993, Geographic asked me to do a story about the information revolution. And this is Bill Gates sitting on a stack of paper. It's not photoshopped. It's uh, to illustrate how much information you can put on a CD. While I was at Microsoft, I met uh, their chief technology officer, Nathan Marable. He was like Bill Gates' Merlin. His job was to look into the future and see where technology was going to be. And between his and Bill's office, he had about eight television screens all going on different channels. And I said, what's that about? He said, well, that's to remind Bill and I and everybody at Microsoft that in the very near future, when fiber optic connects homes, they're going to have 500 channel capability in everybody's home. When I was growing up, we had one channel, it was black and white, and when it rained, you couldn't watch TV. I built this set to, whoa, I, I built that, that set to illustrate the information revolution. Then Nathan did something interesting. He, drew a graph on the board of the information revolution, starting at the Gutenberg Bible, the first printing press to the very near future. And he said, information used to be really expensive, only for the very rich. But in the near future, it was going to be so cheap it'd almost be free. He said international phone calls, which used to cost several, several dollars a minute, would soon be almost free. Any kid with a laptop would have the publishing potential of the New York Times. And he said, photographs would soon be digital, Everyone would have one, and everyone would be a photographer. As he laid out his grand vision for the future, I realized he was describing how my career could go extinct. And the old timer said, well, just because you have a word processor doesn't make you a Hemingway. Just like having a camera doesn't make you an Ansel Adams. And they were right. But so was Nathan. Magazines and newspapers I used to work for started to fold. Thousands of journalists were out of business. Geographics circulation started to plummet, but there's more information available now than ever. There's more people publishing now than ever. But that great big geographic audience where you could influence a whole generation with a single issue has all but vanished. So, but the question is, how big of an audience do you need to create change? What is that tipping point? Turns out it's only 10%. Studies show you'll need 10% need of a committed population before the, the majority just follows. But the study also says if you don't reach that number, that 10% number, there is no, literally no sign of progress in the spread of ideas. And it went on further to say that 
if you don't reach that size audience, it would literally take the same amount of time comparable to the age of the universe for that size group to reach the majority. Now, I like immediate gratification. So I called up this professor and I said, what's with 10%? Why not seven? Why not nine? Why not 19%? And he says, I said, can you put it in English? And he said, yeah, it's like, if you're trying to create steam, it doesn't matter how much you heat up the water unless you reach a boiling point. And then only then you can create steam. It's the same thing with, the, with, the, with, with progress. You need 10% of the population. That's the boiling point for the spread of ideas. And then it made sense to me. It wasn't just that, that geographic story on, on trash was published and recycling just started up. It was a lot of people turning up the heat. It wasn't just that I took a cute picture of a dog that had got saved. 75% of the people in that town saw that newspaper. Of course it gets saved. It's a numbers game. When I was doing the information revolution story for Geographic, the person I wanted to meet the most was this guy that had the Midas touch. He was too busy creating companies back then to be bothered with me to photograph him. But when he was in college, he helped put man on the moon. When he taught at Stanford University, he created a computer company that made movies like Jurassic Park and Toy Story possible. The day he quit that business, he started Netscape, the first commercial, commercial internet browser, the first way that 90% of the world got onto the internet. Created three companies from scratch, made them all worth over a billion dollars. I finally got to meet him when I photographed him for the cover of Fortune magazine. He asked me if I'd teach him how to be a good photographer. I said, I'd teach him how to be a great one if he teach me how to be a billionaire. <laughs> we went all over the world taking pictures, but the thing that we most like to do was to dive. Imagine it's like being an astronaut. You know, you need life support. You're weightless, but there's life everywhere. Jim wasn't happy with the cameras that were available commercially, so he built the best camera ever made so we could document this beautiful life that we're seeing. But every time we went back to a coral reef, it was degraded. In some places, it would be completely destroyed by coral bleaching or dynamite fishing. We were in the Galapagos, and there was fishermen illegally longlining in a marine sanctuary. And Jim said to me, somebody should do something about this. We all have those times in our life where we don't speak up. We, for whatever reason, we're scared, we don't get heard, we don't, don't say what we need to at the right time. Well, back when I was doing that trash cover for National Geographic, I was supposed to meet the artist at a flea market. He's going to turn some junk into art. And he hadn't shown up yet, but this pickup truck pulls out right in front of me in this crowd, and it's busy. And he's driving through. I can see him in the rearview mirror, right behind him. He had these big mirrors so he could see a load behind him. And I could see he's looking straight ahead. He must have seen this family. There's all in a row holding hands a daughter, a son, a mother, and a father. He must have seen them. He didn't. I didn't call out. They got crushed by the truck. I remember the kids still holding on to their parents' hands as they went under the wheels. I've never forgiven myself for that. Why was I too afraid to call out and scream in a crowd when I saw danger? So Jim says to me, somebody should do something about what's going on in the oceans. And I said, how about you and I? He said, what do you mean? I said, we'll make movies about the oceans. So we started this organization called the Oceanic Preservation Society, OPS. I quit my job. We had t-shirts made up with our humble mission statement. And I was, you know, people thought I was crazy. I'm on vacation with our families, Jim and I, down in the Caribbean. We're on his boat. And on the boat comes another guest, Steven Spielberg, one of the most successful directors in the world. And I'm so excited to meet him. I said, Mr. Spielberg, do you have any advice for a first time filmmaker? He goes, yes, never make a movie involving boats or animals. 
the first movie that Jim and I made. It's called The Cove. If you haven't seen it, it involved a lot of boats and animals. Japanese fishermen scare dolphins into a secret cove, and there they kill them, they eat them. The mayor of the town forced children at schools to eat the toxic dolphin meat. And the survivors, they sold to the captive dolphin industry, like the sea worlds of the world. It's a horror movie, like Jaws, except in our movie, people are the monsters and it's real. I'm going to show you a clip from it. <coughs> became one of the most winning documentaries in the world. But the really important thing about that film was that when we started that movie, they were killing tens of thousands of dolphins a year. Today, they're killing less than 3,000 a year, an 82% drop in dolphin deaths because of the activism around this film. We have over a million followers on Facebook, and these are not people that just like us. These are people that are the very vocal 10%. And one of these warriors was Judy Bart. She never made a film before either. She made a film about SeaWorld called Blackfish. 60 million people saw that film in America, 20% of the country. This is SeaWorld stock after Blackfish comes out. We reached that tipping point. And now, the question I ask myself is, can we scale up this success to solve a really big issue, the, the biggest environmental issue humanity has ever faced? I did four stories about extinction for National Geographic magazine. I wrote a book about paleontologists. A lot of paleontologists are my friends, and they're like Merlin. They can look into the past and see where we've been, and look into the future and see where we're going. Right now, we're losing species a thousand times faster than we should be. At the, by the end of the century, we could lose half the species on the planet because of us. This new epoch is called the Anthropocene. It means the age of man. What's causing it? The burning of fossil fuels is not just causing global warming, it's also acidifying the ocean, destroying those beautiful coral reefs that you saw earlier. Twenty-five percent of the species in the ocean live on those coral reefs. A billion people rely on coral reefs for food. You might say, well, too bad about those billion people. I don't eat seafood. But we're also acidifying plankton and warming up plankton, killing plankton at the rate of about 1% a year. Plankton generates more oxygen than all the land plants in the world. Two out of every three breaths that you take, you owe to plankton. Now, here's the other interesting thing. I know you've seen racing extinction here, but the raising of meat for human consumption causes more greenhouse gases than the entire transportation system. Sam Simon, the producer of The Simpsons, told me that a vegan driving a Hummer uses less energy than a meat eater on a bicycle. So if we want to change the world, if we want to save the planet for, for us and other species, we're going to have to get off the of fossil fuels as soon as we can, demand a carbon tax, and stop eating meat. We did a film about this, Racing Extinction. I think a lot of you saw it here. Discovery, the biggest network in the world, showed it. Something, did it, something unprecedented. They showed it in one day in 220 countries and territories. One of the biggest debuts of a doc ever. But if you want to change the world, reach that 10%, 750 million people, we failed. We needed to come up with a, a bigger, more audacious plan. What I wanted to do was use the, build, the most iconic buildings in the world and light them up with images of endangered species. Buildings like the Empire State Building. People thought I was nuts. They said, it'd be too expensive. On a summer in New York City, everybody would be gone. They'd all be in the Hamptons or over here in Europe. And they said, even if you could pull it off, the media wouldn't show up. Nobody can afford to keep people around on a weekend night. So let me show you this. Clip. In 
200 years, people will look back on this particular period and say to themselves, how did those people at that time just allow all these amazing creatures to vanish? But it would be very little use in me or anybody else exerting all this energy to save the wild places if people are not being educated into being better stewards than we've been. Well, my, my kids came to watch this event in New York and we were on a rooftop and they said, Dad, look down the street. And it was like a, a parade. It was like a Thanksgiving parade. You know, tens of thousands of people on the street. We had 939 million media views by Thursday. We're the top trending story on Facebook and Twitter for four days worldwide. I thought, we can't get any bigger than that. And then the Pope called. <laughs> Pope Francis, he's named after St. Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of animals. He wanted to turn up the heat on world leaders while they were meeting at, in Paris at COP21. He wanted to light up the Vatican with endangered species. See another clip? thousand people showed up in St. Peter's Square and just like Nathan Maribold said, they all had cameras. By the time that event was over, we had 4.4 billion media views. Now, any advertiser will tell you that you can't just do it once or twice. You have to do an advertising event seven or eight times before people will get your message, buy your product, or adopt your idea. We have plans to do this all over the world. But you know, we name our own species Homo sapiens. It means the wise ones. But we've, we are pretty incredible sometimes. You know, we've put a person on the moon, a lot of people on the moon. We've created vast global communication networks. We've created virtual worlds, but the real world needs us to live up to our names. We're one step away from greatness, we're the greatest disaster in the last 65 million years. It's time for all of us to use our voice, demand that we get off fossil fuels as soon as we can, demand a carbon tax, and stop eating meat. Thank you. Appreciate it.